All right, good morning. Welcome to today. We are still in our seclusion zone, so let's still have some fun. Uh, we are going to be doing chapter 16 today, appraisals. Um, this is a section in the, the book, once again, that I think they've added uh, because appraising is probably one of the most important factors in this. <clears throat> but it gets confusing as to who the appraiser works for and what they actually do. So first of all, we all know that the appraiser works for the bank, all right? Even though they are hired by the buyer and paid by the buyer, they are actually in fact defending the bank to make sure that the bank is loaning money to this person and this person's offering up collateral in the form of the mortgage, and the bank wants to ensure that the collateral is worth the amount of money. So they hire an educated, trained professional to go out, assess the house, and tell the bank that yes, this house is worth at least what you're lending, all right? Now, preferably, if you think about what an 80% loan to value is, what they're saying is this house is worth more than you're lending on the property. That makes banks feel comfortable. So obviously the lower the loan to value in reverse means that the property is worth more than the loan. And that's what banks like. The more the value of the property and the lower the loan to value creates more safety in the eye of the bank. So 100% loan to value, the bank says, hey, we'll loan 100. The appraiser says the house is worth 100. In an 80%, they said, hey, we'll loan 80. And the bank and the lender says, well, the house is worth 100 grand. So that makes the bank feel more comfortable. And like I told you earlier, that <clears throat> the lender uh, hires this appraiser, paid for by the buyer, but it's really there to protect the lender himself all right so the appraiser as we've noticed once before this is the one person in this chain that we have little to zero interaction with virtually the only interaction you will ever have with an appraisal appraiser rather is when they call you and go hey i need to get in to appraise the property what's the code all right they will not come to your office seeking solicitation they don't want you to call them and hire them because they really want to be as autonomous from you as possible. So that way there's never any doubt that one of the agents doesn't say something like, you know, if this house appraises, there's a pair of Colts tickets in it for you. All right. So that's what they have done. And the Dodd-Frank Act came along and removed this possibility from most appraisers. Now what happens is banks have a list of approved appraisers and they literally just go down the list and whatever loan comes in they assign an appraiser and that person goes out and appraises the property that removes any chance that you're going to get the person beside you uh, as your appraiser now that solution actually causes another problem that you will see later on is the fact that this appraiser that's sitting in Greenwood may get an assignment in Merrillville, all right? Well, if he doesn't really know Merrillville, that could be a problem when he goes to appraise the property, all right? So keep that in mind. Now, the appraiser is often seen as the smartest one of the group of us because they do all the math. Well, let me tell you, they get paid about $400, 450 dollars we get paid about 3,000 or 4,000. Who's smarter, all right? They actually have to do eight to 10 times the amount of work that we have to do to make the same money. Now, I will say the good thing about the appraisal is it's in and out and done, whereas we may spend a month or two months on a property. So there is that advantage to the appraiser, all right? So the appraiser was created, or this appraisal foundation was created by the FIREA Act, uh, the Financial 
institution reform, recovery, and enforcement. I always have to look it up, FIREA, all right? FIREA is what created all of this to make sure the appraisals are trained and educated. Now, in your book, there's a statement that says houses or residential property under $250,000 do not need to be appraised by a certified appraiser. That in fact is true. The problem with that is that most lenders still want this certified appraisal to do appraiser to do the property. Okay. So even though there's a law in the books that says it doesn't have to be, this falls under the old uh, golden rule. They have the gold, so they're making the rule. All right. And that rule is they they want a certified appraiser. So while there is a rule that says it doesn't have to be, almost all federal transactions require that from the lender standpoint, okay? Now, at the top of page 303, the appraiser qualifications, there's this thing called the appraisal foundation. And the appraisal foundation was created under this FIREA Act. In the appraisal foundation, there are two sections. One is called the AQB, the Appraiser Qualification Board. This explains how to become educated or qualified to be an appraiser. That's mainly their job. They establish you know, the rules of education, they establish the schools, things like that. The other side of this is called the ASB, the Appraisal Standards Board. The Standards Board are the ones that create this term that we've used before called USPAP, the Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal Practice. This is the standards on how an appraiser appraises property because what they want is a uniform standard across the United States. That way a lender sitting in Maine can hire a guy in Texas and still get the same true value of the property, all right? While they are licensed per state, the education is pretty much uniform across the board under this thing called USPAP. All right. Now, I told you that brokers are allowed to appraise property unless that appraisal is used to generate a loan, which is that federally bank backed security we just mentioned. But if they do, they still have to follow USPAP. All right. I've appraised three or four properties in my career mainly to generate a value just for their insurance policy, had nothing to do with a loan or a purchase, all right? But when I do, I still follow the Uniform Standard of Professional Appraisal Practice or USPAP, okay? So if you guys ever do that, just remember, you have to follow USPAP. And Article 11 of the Code of Ethics says you should not be doing something you're not familiar with. So if you ever decide to do it, you probably should seek some advice or some other training or just pass on it, all right? Now, when an appraiser appraises property, he gets paid when he appraises the property. Technically, they get paid before they even go out, all right? They get paid a flat fee. It is not a percentage. That looks too much like a commission. So typically they get paid a flat fee and they get paid even if the deal doesn't close. That is another reason why it doesn't look like a commission where you and I only gain our commission when the property closes, that's when we get paid. If the property doesn't close, the appraiser the appraiser still gets paid, all right? So let's talk a little bit about the appraisal and things like that. So let's go over here. Now I've done something a little different this time. Let's see if we can get this to work. I have created 
some predefined slides to try and help us out a little bit. Um, so when you get called to list a property, the seller is going to call you and say, hey, come and list the property for me. And I told you before that a listing event is typically planned. There are times when a buyer is going to call you and say, hey, I'm sitting at the property right now. Can you come and show it to me? Very few sellers will ever say, come right this moment. Usually what happens is they call you and go, hey, Raymond, I want you to list my property. And I'm like, OK, how about five o'clock when you get off work? I'll meet you at the property. Well, that gives us some time. And one of the things that we're going to do is this thing here called a CMA. This is the comparative market analysis or the comps. And we are going to go through these extensively today. But here's the biggest thing you need to understand, that when the appraiser comes out, he is going to give a value on the property, all right? When we give comps, and that should say realtors, not realors, typing is obviously not my strong suit, um, we are going to give a range of values. We are not going to give a value because that would be an appraiser. He's going to come out and say, hey, it's 158. When we did the comps, we're going to come out and go, hey, your offer, your house is somewhere between 155 and 160 because that's how we do comps. And we'll talk a little bit more about it. All right. Now, there's this new thing on the market. And I say new. Now it's probably 10 or 12 years old is this thing called a broker price opinion or BPO. That's the slang. BPOs were real common in 2008, 2009, 2010. And virtually what this is, it is a hybrid of these two. All right. It is the bank not wanting to pay the full fare for a new appraisal. So what they literally do would they would shop these out to real estate brokers who would go out and pull a CMA. And then the very last question would say, in your opinion, what is the value of this property? So they actually were hiring realtors to give a value. And this was used to determine if this person that was going into foreclosure could actually be worthy of a short sale or were they, was the property in danger of valuation and all kinds of things. They typically would pay a broker anywhere from 40 to $75 to do one of these, all right? Now, we had a person in our office who did these exclusively and she did anywhere from I don't know, 20 to 100 in a week. She got really good at them to the point where she would collect four or five or six of them and go out and take pictures and then come back and do all the computer work, all right? She didn't broker at all. She just mainly did broker price opinion, all right? So those were very prominent. Now they're not so uh, much in vogue because the banks, like I said, were just using them mainly to determine the value of this person that's filing a foreclosure. The bank wanted to know, hey, where are we at with this? I did one uh, BPO, bank called me and said, hey, we want you to go check this property. So I went out and looked at the property and I'm driving down the road and they used to do what they would call exteriors or a drive-by. You literally would just go by the house, take a picture of the front, maybe take a picture of the side, something like that of the neighborhood, so I'm driving down this road and I'm looking for like, I can't remember, but let's say it's like 13. I saw 11, a vacant lot, and then 15. So I back up and I'm looking, I'm like, uh, it's a vacant lot. So there happened to be a gentleman standing out in the lawn. And so I rolled down my window. I'm like, hey, what happened to 13, 13 North LaSalle? And he's like, oh, that house burned down about two years ago. He said, hell, the city's already come out and clean it up. 